I do want to mention that uh, I thought I was going to start this week, but it looks like uh, it'll be next week. I, I feel to do a series on Jesus. I'm just going to preach Jesus to you probably for three months. Just nothing but Jesus. So, <clears throat> But today I just feel to tag on something. Uh, about two or three years ago, I felt God challenging me to challenge you, and uh, actually God's challenging all of us, to not live by feelings or circumstances. Remember that? About three years ago, I just threw that out there. And it's been a long hill. Because God doesn't just let you learn theoretically. He, he puts it down in your heart. And so, uh, there's many times on this long hill that I've felt winded. And I've needed to stop for hydration. And this week hasn't been such a horrible week, but uh, just sometimes when, when God is teaching you something and He's allowing you to push against something, it can be overwhelming even if it doesn't seem like it's very much to somebody else. And I feel like, uh, again, this week I was struggling and I didn't even want to preach this Sunday because when I struggle, I feel unsuccessful. And God has to keep teaching me. He's teaching my heart that struggling is not unsuccessful. A lack of success is when I have a wrong attitude. My failure is when I have a wrong attitude. And so, since I'm dealing with this, if you don't mind, I'm just going to tell you how I'm dealing with it, and then if it helps you along the way, good. If you don't have any problems with this, I envy you. I I probably wouldn't even be preaching today if it weren't for my wife's encouragement this week. Uh, I thank God for a good wife that, that loves God. So I'm, I'm practicing what I preach today. I've told you this, and I try to, I'm trying to practice it. Warfare, spiritual warfare, is when the enemy comes against you, and I, not everything is the enemy, but when you are really overwhelmed, uh, and it doesn't really make sense that you're so overwhelmed. When, when you feel gut-punched, and you don't even know how you got gut-punched. When you're when you're not sinning, but you're still being slammed, then instead of being on the defensive and trying to defend yourself to the enemy, it's time to go on the offensive and to speak exactly the opposite of what's coming at you. And that may seem, it may seem more honest to accept the enemy's accusations because there's a little bit of truth in every accusation. But... Uh, we accept it like this. We agree with the adversary quickly while we are on the way with him. The, the enemy comes at me and says, Hanson, you're human. I say, you're right. You're so right. I, I am a slob. I am my very best behavior. My, my righteousness is filthy rags. I'm so glad for Calvary. I'm so glad for the forgiveness of sins. I'm so glad for the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't rest in my righteousness and my goodness. The truth is, he loves me and I'm doing my very best. And, and we're, we're going to kick your tail. That's spiritual warfare. You turn it around. And uh, not, I'm no, I don't do that bravely. I'm not a soldier by uh, choice. God drafted me. And uh, so I want to talk to you today about assurance. I, I first visited my wife in Texas way back in the 80s. And was on the tail end of the uh, well, I guess the 60s carried over into the 70s, and down in Austin, Texas, in the summertime, you could go downtown, and by the city hall, in the park, were thousands of hippies. And they all had guitars, they were sitting around playing their guitars and sleeping in the park and doing other things in the park, and uh, if you go to Austin today, they're gone. They found out that you can't just hang out in the park and sing about peace and along comes peace. You can't, can't just sit around and talk about how we ought to feed the world's population without going and getting a job yourself. But they were looking for peace. And I think that's a universal thing. We're looking for peace. Peace, to me, is really assurance. I want some assurance. And so, uh, to help you focus on this, I've asked my wife if we could sing that old song, Blessed Assurance, and then we're going to pray. Would you sing this with me? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. This is where we draw our peace from. Guess we don't have any sound here. (laughs) 
blessed assurance assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory Thank you, Jesus, for your blood, for your washing. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Thank you for that assurance, God. I pray you'd put the assurance in every heart, every mind. Would you sing it one more time? My story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. you thank him for his assurance. Thank you, God, for your blessed assurance. Thank you for your love and your help, God. Thank you for your perspective, for your direction, for your encouragement here today, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love you, God. I'd like to read this scripture to begin from the Amplified Bible, John chapter 6, verse 47. Whenever Jesus said in the King James Version, verily, verily, he's really saying, I assure you. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, he who believes in me, who adheres to, trusts in, relies on, and has faith in me, has, now possesses, eternal life. Not whosoever has a job, not, not whosoever has a winning personality, not whoever, who, whoever has a great intellect. That's not where our assurance comes from. Whoever has Him. And when I have Him, I'm not going to have eternal life. When I have Him, I already have eternal life. It's a blessed assurance. You may be seated. I'd like you to do some research with me for just a minute. And I, I, want, I need some feedback from you here. Maybe just a little different, but uh, I, I want to do four research projects very quickly here. I'm going to give you some data, and I want you to think about it, and I want you to give me a judgment on it. I want you to decide if what we dig out of Scripture mainly is predicting that life will be an easy street or a utopia or a struggle. And... We'll keep it easy. I'd like for you just to say easy or challenge. 
So let's practice. Everyone say easy. Easy. Everyone say challenge. Now, I need an answer from you with each one of these, these, these little research bits, and I'll, I'll ask you for your response. Is it easy or is it a challenge? Let me begin with the Scripture, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. All these three will be from the New Living Translation. These are all words of Jesus. Then Jesus said to His disciples, If any of you wants to be My follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow Me. Easy or challenge? Matthew chapter 24, verse 9. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are My followers. Easy or challenge? John chapter 16, verses 32 and 33. But time is coming, indeed it's now here, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you all this that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Easy or challenge? You're, it's getting quieter, but... Let's do another research here. The Scriptures refer to us as ambassadors, as soldiers, as servants, as laborers, and as workers. It also calls us kings and priests, and sometimes we think, well, that would be nice, but if you've ever been a priest or minister, or if you've ever been a king, you'll realize it's not everything it's cracked up to be. Do those names, ambassador, soldier, servant, laborer, worker, does that indicate easy or challenge? If you live for God, it will not be easy. So you can't in your brain look for easy street to reassure you that you're doing the right thing. It may seem a little bit simple. But you need to understand, life is a challenge whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. The difference is Christians try to find relief some other way. That's why they have multiple marriages. That's why they get into drugs and alcohol. They're not any more wicked than you or I. They're trying to find easy street. They hurt. They don't like the hurt, so they go find an escape some way. It might not be drugs. It might be work. It might be money. It might be extreme sports. But they're all looking for some kind of sense of success and, and, and gliding along and enjoying life because somehow we've got this idea that life is supposed to be utopia. So let's do another experiment here. I'm going to name a Bible character and a few attributes for their life, and you tell me if you think their life was easy or a challenge. All right, Noah who built an ark for 120 years, who was the weirdo in town. Who t- t- he was like the guy holding the sign saying the world is coming to an end. He saw entire population of the world except for his family die. When the ark settled back on Ararat, he walked out. You know why he got drunk? There, there had to have been bodies everywhere. Easy or challenge? Moses. He was born, had to go live in someone else's house. He was not really an Egyptian. He was not really an Israelite. He finally tried to solve the problem, was banished as an exile out into the wilderness, was a shepherd for many years. Then God calls him back. When He does, He gives him this congregation that that grumbles for 40 years. Easy or challenge? Hosea was told to take a wife that was a harlot. And then when she ran off and was a harlot again, God told him to go take her back. Easy or hard? Easier challenge, sorry. Elijah, great gifts. He did great miracles. He called fire down from heaven. He shut up the heavens. He opened up the heavens. He did awesome things, but he was hated for it. And he ended up being very poor, living off widows, living out in the desert by a brook. Easier challenge. Jeremiah, who was a prophet, who heard from God, who spoke the truth, and because he did, he was thrown into a pit. He was hated by everybody for telling the truth. Easier challenge. Joseph who dreamed and God caused him to be sold by his brothers into slavery and then he did everything right and got shafted by a, a, an adulterous woman and then he went to prison and it was down there for maybe, some people think, as many as 15 years. Easier challenge. 
Daniel, who was already in exile, but he lived an excellent life. He was a government official doing everything he knew how to do, but he was politically shafted and thrown into a, a lion's den for doing everything right. Easier challenge. Jesus, who was born poor, did everything he was supposed to do, treated everyone exactly how they should have been treated, healed people, preached like nobody else ever preached, but he was rejected of men. He was hounded from everywhere he went, he was hounded, and finally they caught him and they slaughtered him on Calvary. Easy or challenge? The disciples who were also poor, who were persecuted, who were eventually scattered throughout the earth, and each one of them died as martyrs. Easy or challenge? So where are we getting the idea that it's supposed to be easy? Something in us is repulsed by challenge, and and God has to teach my heart that challenge is supposed to be awesome. I'm supposed to embrace challenge. I'm supposed to say, awesome, bring it on. This is my opportunity. But I don't do that naturally. My heart doesn't do that naturally. God has to teach me the hard way. One more research project. Just look at nature itself. If you just look at the handiwork of God, if you look at the wild kingdom, if you were a bear today in New England, would it be easy or a challenge? You might be sleeping right now, so in that sense it wouldn't be bad, but if you were a deer right now, easy or a challenge? And and for those who try to solve this, I've heard of people who, for example, they love animals, so they want to... They want to make us perfect world, and so they pretend we can have a world where we don't kill animals. But you know, if we didn't kill them, they'd kill each other. And if you don't want to be a meat eater because of health reasons, that's one thing, but if you just don't want to kill animals, and so you say, let's not kill any animals so we don't take their meat because that's so brutal, then you have to ask yourself, isn't it brutal for animals to clamp down on cabbage and tear up the roots of carrots and demolish those living creatures and just chew them to bits. And Life is violent. And even if we didn't have the animal in the plant world being violent, you've got fire, forest fires, and you've got glaciers, and you've got, uh, even now out there, pipes breaking, the, the, the cold is, is getting everywhere. The cold is killing right now. There, there are little varmints out there breathing their last because they're being frozen out in our violent world. And God made it. So I have to just make my peace with that and say, get over it, bud. Life is brutal. And when life is brutal to you, that doesn't mean you failed. It means life is brutal. Anyone who's ever been by the bedside of someone who's died of a disease, especially cancer or something that can can linger on and cause so much pain, you know that life is brutal. And you can call out to an almighty God and sometimes He heals, but sometimes He lets people go through years of pain, struggle. And I don't like that. I want, a, I want a sermon, and I want a faith. I want a, a doctrine that says every time there's anything going wrong in my life, I just call out and say it in Jesus' name, and poof, there it goes, gone. God has to teach me a different way. Where do we get that idea that everything's supposed to be wonderful? Well, think about it. First of all, everybody wants comfort. Everybody wants equilibrium. Everybody wants that. that that's a good good thing. We, we try to make things better. We try to make things comfortable. I'm not against it. I'm not voting for a horrible life. I'm just saying that somehow we think if we don't have this perfect life that something is wrong. And along comes all the con men of the world to play on that. How do cons pick up kids to kip, kidnap them? Bags of candy, right? How do Advertisers get your hard-earned money. You deserve a break today. Everybody's telling you it should be easy. Everybody's telling you if you'll just buy my book of seven ways to the top for twenty-one ninety-five, you will have a wonderful life. Of course, they're trying to get their twenty-one million dollars to go have their nice life while you're reading their book. Every con man. And every con government, uh, government is, when it's doing things God's way, can be wonderful. It can 
solve hunger problems. It can protect people. It can, it can keep peace. It can help a lot of things. But every government in the world to date has always eventually gone astray because men got their fingers in there. And you know how governments, especially democracies, how they turn bad? They start promising to their people easy street. That's how Hitler got in. He was voted in. Solutions. I've got a way to make it easy for you. Just vote us in to be powerful and and let us control your kids and let us control your health and let us control all these things. And government tries to get its tentacles in. It doesn't matter if it's if it's socialist government or democracy or a monarchy. When, whenever it starts promising you easy street, it's doing just what the devil does. It's, it's trying to find that little strain in you that's looking for utopia and promise that to you if, it'll, if you'll just play the game. And Jesus comes along and says, don't believe all that mishmash. That, that's a bunch of junk. It's not going to be easy. You come pick up your cross, and we're going we're gonna to head right into this thing, and they're going to hate you for it, and people aren't going to like you, and you're going to have a rough road to hoe, but man, we're going to go here together, and it's going to be awesome. And people look at him like, really? There's a guy down the, the road has got a better pitch than you have, Jesus. And if we're not careful... I want to preach healing, and I want to preach peace. I'm preaching it today. I want to tell people how great God is, but if, if we're not careful, we start appealing to people's selfishness and to their desire for easy street, and we say, come to Jesus. He'll make everything all right. Well, Jesus does make everything all right, but not the way you think He's going to make it all right. For example, Jesus will heal your relationships, but usually it's by you forgiving someone or turning the cheek. It's usually not Him beating up your enemies. So there's a lot of frustration that happens. And on this long hill that we've been climbing, to get over our feelings and our emotions, one of the things that that the long hill does for us is it purifies motives and it shows us how selfish we really are. We come to church, and if we're not careful, we make it like an Amway meeting or a see you at the top meeting. Those are not bad. Those are just things people go to because they're motivated to go learn how to make more money because they want money. Money's not wrong. It's not wrong to make a living. But when you come to church to learn how to make your life cushy, you've missed the point. This is His kingdom. And He wants us to come buy into His kingdom. But along the way, in our humanity, there's room. I've had bad motives at times. Sometimes people can minister more for them than for the people that they're ministering to. And so God has to allow them to minister to people and not to fulfill their longings anymore. And sometimes when people find out that ministry isn't so fun, they just pull back and say, it's not for me. And that's how ministries are ruined. But when they can can instead get over their selfishness and start ministering for the right reasons, it can be a fulfilling way to live and God's kingdom can prosper and, and God gives us victory over these things. He teaches our heart the way to hold life. So, my success is if I can have a right attitude, and and Nathan was all over today, where Jesus is Lord, He is the good shepherd, and I am the sheep. That's offensive to us. That's, That's what his schoolmate was balking at. That's what most people balk at. You're just going to follow along and blindly go do whatever. What they're saying is, you're just going to go do whatever God tells you to do. I'm not that gullible. I'm going to go do what the Red Red Sox tell me to do. I'm going to go do what the punkers tell me to do. I'm I'm going to go do what what Cyrus Mighty, whatever her name is, is doing. We are sheep, and He's the shepherd. And fulfillment is when I die to myself and I live toward His goals, and then He takes care of me and there's peace. But I don't come just looking for a give, a give me, give me, give me peace. I come, die to my life, and live to His life, and the result is peace. That's the trouble. You can't come to God for what you can get and make it work. You have to come to God on His terms. 
And that's why the crowds are low. That's why not many people go to church. Because they'll go try Walmart. It's more satisfying than church on Sunday morning. At least you can find a bargain and go home and chew on it or something like that. Instead of sitting and listening to a guy who keeps telling you what you don't want to hear. I struggle because although I all my life have heard the truth and all my life I, I've, I've known this in my head, still somewhere in my heart, I'm hoping if I just do good enough and I've, I've just minister enough and I just pray hard enough that one of these days it's all going to smooth out and there's going to be plenty of money and I'm not going to have problems. And now, I, I know that intellectually. I know that's not realistic, but somewhere in my heart I still hunger for that. And, and the enemy comes along and every time everything's not as smooth as my heart, that little thing in my heart tells me it could be, then I start thinking, God's cheating me. I'm messing up. This is a stupid thing. Somebody else shafted me. The church isn't doing right. My family, if they'd only do right, I could be happy. And everything, the enemy tries to get me to turn against anything he can get me to turn against. And because I don't understand that, he cons me. So, I just like to remind you of where assurance and peace is supposed to really come from. And I want to do that by just reading three scriptures, and I'm going to read them from two translations. We struggle. We will struggle. But I can enjoy peace and assurance in the midst of my struggle if I have my head on straight and my heart on straight. So let's look at scripture, John chapter 14, verse 27. By the way, you're the one that told me it's a challenge. Your preacher didn't tell you it was a challenge. You read the scripture and you looked at the Bible stories and you looked at nature itself and you told me that this wasn't supposed to be easy. But a challenge, if, if I can think right, can be invigorating. A challenge can be something that makes me feel alive. Jesus said, before he left, just before he left, just before they slaughtered him, just before they were scattered, just before the worst day in the disciples' life, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. This is not a toke that makes your brain shut down so you feel peaceful. This is not a chemical that you put in your body that makes your body malfunction so you forget about reality so you feel okay for a while. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is what the Amplified says. Peace I leave with you, my own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. That's what we, do not, we decide. Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. Would you read that with me together? Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. Go ahead and read the rest. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. That's where peace comes from. Why am I not intimidated? Why am I not cowardly? Why am I not unsettled? Because it's not my kingdom. I'm, I'm blending in like was read today. I'm part of the body of Christ. I just have my little part here. But we're this massive kingdom of God moving forward in this world. And I'm just a little soldier. I'm just taking my little spot here. I take my little pot shot. I may even die in this whole thing. But this kingdom is going forward. And that's why I can have peace. And that's why I can be unintimidated. And I, I may die in the battle, but the war is going to be won. And I ultimately will be living forever in the kingdom of God. It's going to go on forever and ever. Then Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, when we're talking in theory, this sounds neat. We can all clap and we can all feel good and say, Brother Hanson, that was a great sermon. But even Brother Hansen has to go home and figure out how to live this thing out. And when I'm spiritually minded and I come in contact with carnal world, sometimes what I figured out in Scripture and what I heard in a sermon doesn't seem to match what I deal with in everyday life. Again, maybe this doesn't happen to you, but to me it's that way. Sometimes I absolutely know the truth, but I'm looking at my bills 
I absolutely know that God takes care of me, but I have a sickness that He has not yet healed. I absolutely know that He'll never leave me or forsaken me, forsake me, but it's been three weeks and I don't feel like He's spoken to me. And that's when this spiritually minded stuff offends me. And I feel like saying, forget this. This is stupid. My flesh is always arguing with my spirit, the Bible says. There's always a war going on in me. I always have to decide, am I going to let my carnal thinking reign or my spiritual thinking? Because spiritual thinking is really uh, the devil and everybody else is calling you an ignoramus when you think spiritually. This is how the Amplified says it. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, Mind you, the reason sometimes you can't convince your family members and friends to believe the way you do is because they don't have the Holy Spirit. But without God's Spirit teaching them, they just won't get it. It's, they're just clueless. So the mind of the flesh is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. It's death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. So somehow, I've got to not only believe and think in the Spirit, but I've got to let my heart have a soul peace. I've got to, when the enemy comes after my feelings, when the enemy comes after me spiritually, when the enemy kicks me in the gut, and I just feel like giving up, that's when someone coming along and encouraging me is, is just giving me a dose of something to my soul to give me peace in my soul. And it doesn't take my circumstances away, and it doesn't even take my feelings away, but somehow it just helps me to, to think right and hold it right. It's like a warm coat on a cold day. And then Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And I'm going to be a little short today if anyone wants to say Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. From the Amplified Bible. And let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from, as Nathan said, Christ rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts. In other words, when your peace is disturbed, the umpire is saying, something's wrong, something's wrong here. You're supposed to let that peace of God in you stand up and declare, that's not right, something's out of order here. Let the peace, harmony, which comes from Christ's rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts. Deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in that peaceful state. That's when you're listening to that still small voice. To which as members of, the Christ, of Christ's one body, you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. Would you stand? S.C. E. Eldridge wrote a book called Becoming Myself, and she told about how a few years ago she was a part of a church in California that a young man from Uganda attended. His name was Daniel. And he had lived in Uganda under the reign of Idi Amin. He was in prison there. He was beaten. He was tortured. He had scars to prove it. He was imprisoned in Uganda simply for being a Christian. And many of his days in prison, he was beaten. During one particular trial, they hung him upside down. And the sole responsibility of the guard was just to beat him. That's all he did. Beat him, took a rest and beat him. After his guard was done one day with his ritual torture, he started to leave, and Daniel said, have a nice evening. Then 
that stupid. That doesn't make sense. My carnal mind wouldn't do that. That's chumpish. But he just said, have a nice day. Have a nice evening. It makes you wonder, which of those two men was really free? Well, that comment just completely undid the guard. And he said, how can you say that to me after I just beat you? Which opened the door for him to tell him about Jesus. And later, that guard helped Daniel escape. but Not before he took him home to his family and let Daniel tell his story to his entire family. Here's what she writes. We can be so free. It begins here with an internal choice to let Christ so invade our hearts that we cannot be held to any sort of bondage internally. We choose to love, to forgive. We choose not to fear. We choose life. Most of us are probably still laboring under the impression that freedom comes first in our circumstances and then we can experience love, joy, peace, patience, and all the other wonderful fruit of the Spirit. Not so. Would you say that sentence with me? Not so. One more time. Not so. God usually begins with the transformation of our attitudes. Then He can change our circumstances. One thing that really irks a lot of us about God is we found out when He wants to do something, He won't let up. Every once in a while, you and I get this sneaking suspicion that the reason we're struggling with money or the reason we're struggling with health or whatever is because we've got things out of perspective and God's just not going to let it fly until we go back to where we need to go. So today... You might be stubborn and God's really messing with you. God may not be letting your revenue streams open up until you get the kingdom of God first. Selfishness has ruined so many lives. Too much money, too good of a job has ruined so many people. Selfishness keeps people from ministering because they're so worried about the cow they just bought or the wife they just married that they can't think about the... Har- the, the, the uh, the wedding feast they're supposed to be attending. They're so worried about making ends meet and getting their education and getting enough money in the bank that they don't have time to study the Word of God or to minister to somebody else along the way. And so you know what God does? He lets them fail again and again and again and again until they seek first, first, the kingdom of God, His righteousness. You know, I heard a Uh, a talking head the other day say, well, you know, uh, there's a lot of people who are Christians and they believe a lot of different things because there's a lot of different ways to interpret the Bible. Well, you know, most people who say that haven't interpreted the Bible. They don't even read the Bible. That's a cop-out. How many ways can you interpret thou shalt not murder How many ways can you interpret thou shalt not sleep with your neighbor's wife? How how many ways can you interpret all liars and effeminate shall have their place in the lake of fire? How many ways can you interpret that? How many ways can you interpret what Jesus told us about selfishness? If any of you wants to be my follower... A Christian. You're not a Christian because you go to church. You're not a Christian because you say you're a Christian. You're a Christian because you, you, obey, you obey what Christ taught. You can't be a Christian and still embrace a lifestyle that Christ did not embrace. You don't have the right to do that. But probably 90% of Christians today, because they don't want to deal with our culture, are willing to embrace a philosophy that doesn't fit Christianity and still call themselves Christians. They're frauds. They're hypocrites. They're liars. If you don't believe what Jesus said, then quit calling yourself a Christian and go be something else. 
be a Timson or a whatever you are, a, a Joanson, or you know, just, just go start your own movement, but quit lying to everybody and saying you're a Christian. Jesus said, I'm not a Christian if I'm being selfish. Now, we're all selfish at times, so I have to keep working at this. I have to pick up my cross and follow Him. And I have to quit whining about the weight of my cross, which I do quite regularly. I have to teach my heart that real joy is not carrying the cross, but it's when I quit whining while I'm carrying the cross. Because when I whine, I make myself and everybody around me miserable. But when that seed falls into the ground and dies, when my desire for whatever dies, when if God's called me to preach the gospel, at first I can want to preach because I get to be up in front of everybody. But God in ministry very quickly cures you of that. And then after a while, when you start feeling like, I hope He doesn't ask me to preach, that's proof that selfishness is set in and you seek first your kingdom Because you don't want to get up and look foolish. I look foolish every Sunday. I have to die. I had to get up here and tell you that I'm weak and human. But that's because I have to bring myself to let Jesus flow through me. And it's really better for me. I, I, I'm not complaining to you. It, if I can ever do this right, whenever I do this right, God flows and God does awesome things and people come up to me and say I said brilliant things and I didn't even know I said them. That's, that's where peace and joy and assurance come from. I'm saying that for some of you who are struggling. Don't struggle with the struggle. Just struggle with the attitude. And I think it would be fitting if we ended with the song that we started with. And, and I want to challenge you to come to the altar in just a minute and don't repent. Just come and make it all about Him. Let's skip all of the deals. Let's, let's not promise God that the next three weeks we're going to be perfect. Let's just come right now and say, you know what? I'm going to have peace and joy today because I'm going to make it all about you. And I'm not going to even talk about yesterday, which I didn't make about you, but I'm just going to make it all about you. At least for these few minutes in the altar, I'm going to make it all about you. Would you just come and would you sing and would you let your heart and your mind and your spirit all get aligned with God? Blessed assurance, because I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Hallelujah. Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I But now, it's all about you, Jesus. I need your amazing grace today. Let your peace be my assurance. Let it be my guardian. Let it be my referee. Let it be a garrison in my heart. That's oh. saved. the sheep. You're the shepherd. You're the Lord. You're the sovereign one. I'm going to quit looking for easy street and I'm going to embrace the life that you've given me. I'm going to run this race. I'm going to endure as a good soldier. I'm going to fight this fight. Oh no. And when we first believe, the grace, how sweet 
the sound that saved a wretch like me. was blind, but now I see. That taught my heart to fear and grace. Oh, you taught me, Jesus. Teach me your way. Show me your paths. Lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Hear that grace of me. How I first believe. Amazing grace. How sweet That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. But now I see. God, your grace is so amazing. Your grace is so amazing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I apply this one more way and then I'd like to see a blessed assurance? I don't know if, if I quite conveyed how this helped me this week, but when I'm able to quit tying my success to circumstances or feelings, then I outwit the, the con man because the con man can mess with my circumstances. We know that from the book of Job. And the con man can mess with my feelings. There can be a, a spirit of heaviness come over me for no reason at all. Nothing I've ever done. I haven't touched it, done anything wrong, haven't sinned, haven't let anything come into my life, but it's just the, an attack of the enemy. And I don't blame every feeling on the, the devil. It's just my job to talk about those things, all right? Sometimes you're just a grump. You just need to get over it. Sometimes you just need to, you know, eat better and go to sleep on time, and then you, you won't have a lot of those issues. But sometimes the enemy will come at us, and if we, the first thing we do is agree oh, yeah, I'm probably rotten and, you know, I probably messed up here. And if I really love Jesus, I wouldn't have these feelings. Well, where do I get that? I should get, if I love Jesus, I'm going to have all kinds of feelings. Hate's going to come at me. But somehow I'm going to be able to, after God teaches me this, to, to just have a joy that's an internal joy, a soul peace. So we'll, we're going to close with this. Blessed assurance. And this week, I'll give you a homework assignment. First and foremost, you need to make sure you're living right. You need to pray and all that kind of stuff. That, that's a given. But when you feel overwhelmed by circumstances or feeling, just go back to this concept, how, how blessed I am and how, how wonderful it is that I have eternal life. And the enemy is nagging me, but that's because he's losing the game in my life. And there's this... I'm blessed. I'm human. I mess up, but I'm blessed. I might have even caused these bad circumstances. I might have been, I might have not put the candle out and it caught the curtain on fire. It might have been my fault, but I'm not going to believe the devil when he tells me that I'm, that God's let my house burn down because I'm a jerk. I'm going to say, you know, life means that I'm going to be foolish sometimes. Life means that I'm going to mess up sometimes. Man, 
I've got this heavenly Father who's taking care of everything. One of these days, this is going to be in the rearview mirror, just a little, little, little bit of a dot on my rearview mirror back in time, and I'm going to be in eternity worshiping Him forever and ever. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine.